This video is sponsored by CuriosityStream. Chicago is an incredibly picturesque city, and part of its good looks comes from its lakeshore. There is a nearly contiguous ribbon of green separating Lake Michigan from some of the best architecture in the U.S. Of the city's 29 miles of lakefront, all but four are today public parkland. There's Jackson Park, home to the White City, Chicago's World Fair in 1893. You have impressive cultural institutions like the Museum of Science and Industry, the Adler Planetarium, Shedd Aquarium, Field Museum, and Art Institute. Grand Park and Buckingham Fountain frame the iconic Michigan Avenue. You've got Millennium Park with its now famous art and architecture. Navy Pier, Lincoln Park, marinas, and beautiful sandy beaches round out the amenities. It's an embarrassment of riches that might be surprising to somebody who only knows Chicago as the city of broad shoulders, the hog butcher of the world, and the center of the U.S. freight rail network. But back when the city was founded, there was no detailed plan for lakefront recreation. In fact, before the Chicago fire, Michigan Avenue was lakefront property. The story of Chicago's lakefront rise to greatness begins fittingly with the railroads. In 1852, the Illinois Central Railroad received a charter from the state of Illinois to build lines connecting Chicago and Galena to Cairo at the southern tip of the state. By the 1850s, Chicago already had several rail lines, and there were few suitable locations for a new line and depot. The city recommended the railroad build tracks over the water along the lake and construct a depot north of Randolph Street. Chicago residents will be familiar with this location, as it's still a passenger rail depot today, serving passengers on the South Shore and Metro Electric District commuter rails. The city of Chicago had an ulterior motive for allowing the rail line to be built out in Lake Michigan. At the time, Michigan Avenue was right on the lake. On the western side of Michigan Avenue stood the residences of Chicago's elite, who all enjoyed pristine views of the lake. On the eastern side of Michigan Avenue was Lake Park. You would think these elites would be huge nimbies and not want a loud, smoky train marring their view. And you would be right, except for the fact that their homes were in danger. Lake Park was a narrow strip of land and was not so slowly eroding and disappearing. By 1850, lake currents had washed away 20 of the 35 acres that made up the park. There was little preventing their homes from being next. Numerous attempts at funding an offshore breakwater had gone nowhere, as the Michigan Avenue elites wanted the city to pay for it, and other city residents wanted Michigan Avenue to pay, as they were rich and would benefit the most. The railroad line would serve as a breakwater and stop the erosion and neither the city nor Michigan Avenue would have to pay for it, so that's what happened. With the terminal and rail yards north of Randolph Street, the view of the lake was still largely unimpeded, so the rich folks still got some of what they wanted. Those good times didn't last very long, because in October 1871, the Great Chicago Fire destroyed 3.3 square miles, or 8.5 square kilometers, of the city. It incinerated over 17,000 buildings, Illinois Central's passenger station on Randolph, and all of the railroad's freight operations along the Chicago River. The fire consumed much of the central lakeshore, including all of those fancy homes on Michigan Avenue. The fire is often seen as a turning point in the history of Chicago, and it absolutely is an inflection point for the lakefront. First, the area on the lake between Lake Park and the Illinois Central Rail Line was filled in from debris from the fire. This new land became an expanded lake park, but it also hosted temporary buildings as the rest of the city rebuilt. The Michigan Avenue elite didn't protest, one because they absolutely saw the need in the aftermath, and two, because many didn't rebuild on Michigan Avenue. Instead, they built opulent mansions further south on Prairie Avenue. This doesn't mean Michigan Avenue residents wouldn't be NIMBYs, it would just be a new group after the city had regained its footing. The fire happened right as a big legal battle over the waterfront was heating up. The big question was, who actually controlled the lakefront? You have to remember that we're talking about the United States in its first 100 years of existence and there were not long histories of laws on rights to waterfronts, lake beds, and riparian areas, nor the Supreme Court precedents to back up those laws. In the case of the Chicago waterfront, you have four main players. First, the city of Chicago, who controlled all of Lake Park except for three blocks on the northern end. Those blocks, plus the lake itself, was claimed by the federal government. They wanted to build a new outer harbor beyond the railway to complement the inner harbor of the Chicago River. Illinois Central believed they had the rights to build an outer harbor and control the waterfront. Finally, the state of Illinois claimed the lakefront and lake. These battles raged on in the Illinois state legislature, various courts, and in newspaper headlines. In 1892, it finally worked its way up to the U.S. Supreme Court, where the various ownership and control issues were detangled. The state, not the federal government, were given control of the lake and lake bed. 
The railroads could keep the right of way they already had, as the state had granted it to them back in 1851. And the city could retain its claim to Lake Park, including the federal blocks to the north. The Supreme Court's granting power to the state also came with an implication that the lake and lakefront should be used for the public trust. This could mean commerce, but it also meant that a single corporation, like a railroad, couldn't impede on the public's access to the lake. It was a public resource. That case was tried in 1892, five months before the opening of the World's Columbian Exposition, better known as the 1893 Chicago World's Fair. It was meant to celebrate the 400th anniversary of Columbus's arrival in the New World, but it also celebrated Chicago's renaissance after the fire. Many fair boosters wanted the fair to be located in Lake Park. It made sense. It was centrally located, adjacent to downtown, and well-connected by rail thanks to the Illinois Central Railroad. But Lake Park wasn't wide enough for a fairground. Michigan Avenue and the rail line hemmed it in, and neither could be easily moved. Michigan Avenue NIMBYs didn't want the fair right across the street either. Finally, that part of the lakefront was still being contested during the years leading up to the fair during the planning stages, and the Supreme Court case was meant to remove that roadblock. Only the court's ruling came far too late in the process, and the Lake Park idea was scrapped in favor of a southern fairgrounds in Jackson Park. Frederick Law Olmsted and Kelver Vox, the designers of New York Central Park, designed Jackson Park, the Midway Plaisance, and Washington Park in 1871. It was spared by the fire. Olmsted and the famed planner Daniel Burnham had pitched the Jackson Park site and eventually drew up plans for the fairgrounds. The World's Fair deserves its own video, but it put Jackson Park on the map as one of Chicago's finest lakefront destinations. Today it features beaches, the first golf course in the Midwest, the impressive Museum of Science and Industry, and other park amenities. The fairground was known as the White City, and Burnham's design brought him much acclaim. Chicagoans wish their entire city could be like it. Burnham and his colleague Edward Bennett were more than happy to oblige and produced the Plan of Chicago in 1909. It's the plan that gave us the famous quote, make no little plans, they have no magic to stir men's blood, and probably themselves will not be realized. Make big plans, aim high and hope and work. It's a very historically important plan that really deserves its own video, but for now what we need to know is that it inspired Chicagoans to reevaluate their Lake Park lakefront and expand it. Burnham's vision for the lakefront included a massive natural history museum as a centerpiece, funded by the department store magnet Marshall Field. It would also include a library and other cultural institutions. The new park, named Grant Park after the former U.S. president, was built on 128 acres of new land, which today has been expanded to 319 acres. If you're familiar with the present-day Grant Park, you know that it doesn't match Burnham's vision of the lakefront, like at all. Much of Burnham's urban design vision for Chicago ended up on the cutting room floor, so perhaps this isn't surprising. You can see that the waterfront in his plan is bracketed by two large piers extending into Lake Michigan. Only one was built, and not that exact design. Today it's known as Navy Pier, a popular entertainment space. But you'll notice that at the center of that entire waterfront plan is the Natural History Museum, what's now called the Field Museum. But the Field Museum doesn't have that prominent location today is shunted off on the side of Grant Park, along with the Adler Planetarium and Shedd Aquarium. In fact, there are no major structures in Grant Park at all, save for the Art Institute. The reason for this is pretty simple. Those Michigan Avenue NIMBYs again. But this time, there was a mega NIMBY, the most powerful of all. His name was Aaron Montgomery Ward. That name might be familiar because he founded a mail order and department store company that lasted over 100 years, closing in 2001. He built his corporate headquarters on Michigan Avenue across from Lake Park and Grand Park in the late 19th century. He sued the city four times to keep buildings out of Grant Park, and those cases went to the Illinois Supreme Court. And all four times he won to keep those buildings out. How did he win those cases? Well, there's a legal concept known as the Public Dedication Doctrine, which states that property owners abutting a public space can sue to ensure the public space is used according to its stated purpose. The original subdivision map for Grant Park said it was public ground forever to remain vacant of buildings. War spent over one million in today's dollars ensuring that this phrase was literally enforced. Though he didn't sue when the Art Institute of Chicago was constructed, as he was a major patron and supporter of the arts. He also didn't sue when the federal government built a temporary post office, as his catalog business relied on the mail. Basically, he sued for all the buildings he didn't like, though he said he did it to keep the lakeshore open to the masses. Sure, right. Whatever the reasons, to this day, Grant Park has no major buildings, save for the Art Institute. Buckingham Fountain, one of the world's largest, was added in 1927. It wasn't a building, so nobody sued. 
With Jackson Park and Grant Park's history firmly established, let's look north of the Chicago River to the Streeterville neighborhood. Much like the area south of the river, Chicago used to end just past Michigan Avenue, where St. Clair Street is today. But through sedimentation and some small fills, land was gradually added in a way that roughly mirrored the additions to the south. The most well-known addition was created by George Wellington Streeter. According to Streeter, his steamboat ran aground on a sandbar near Superior Street. He left the boat there and continued to live on it as the sandbar grew around the stranded ship. Streeter, by all accounts a scoundrel, swindler, and opportunist, aided the sedimentation by filling in 186 new acres of land. Now, this story is most likely false because Streeter, as I just mentioned, wasn't exactly an honest person. The real story is that he intentionally grounded his ship and became a squatter as the island grew around his boat naturally. Attempts to evict him were half-hearted, and he made a living, when he wasn't in prison, selling deeds to lots he may not have actually owned. From this auspicious beginning, the Streeterville neighborhood was born. Further north is another highlight of the Chicago lakefront, Lincoln Park. No, the other one. This park is Chicago's largest and stretches from Grand Avenue near Navy Pier to Lakefront Hollywood Beach seven miles north. It features the Lincoln Park Zoo, a conservancy, and the Chicago History Museum. There are also seven public beaches, popular when Chicago doesn't look like this. One of the major features was a pleasure drive. Lakeshore Drive in Lincoln Park proved incredibly popular and also ensured great unobstructed views of the lake. This drove up property values on the edge of the park and attracted more wealthy Chicagoans. The part of Lakeshore Drive just north of Streeterville eventually became known as the Gold Coast because of its wealthy residents. The city and wealthy landowners wanted to extend Lakeshore Drive further to the south along Streeterville to the Chicago River. They succeeded in 1889, but it proved unpopular as one of the only attractions on this new route was Streeter himself living on a patch of vacant, muddy land. The city finally evicted him in 1918, and he died in 1921. The disagreements over Streeter's dubious claims over the ownership of the land in Streeterville meant that development along the now-expanded Lakeshore Drive was slow, especially given how centrally located the area was. But with the construction of Navy Pier in 1914 and Northwestern University Chicago campus in 1926, the area began to take shape. One outcome of the Streeterville saga was a renewed sense that new land coming from the lake should be for public use, not for private development. Today, Streeterville continues to be one of the narrowest parts of the public lakeshore, with only a trail and freewayified Lakeshore Drive. Chicago did not want to repeat this outcome. Lakeshore Drive was also beginning to take shape south of the Chicago River. Burnham proposed a transportation link between Old Lake Park and Jackson Park during the World's Fair period, and again introduced the idea in the plan of Chicago. It seemed to make sense to have a boulevard connecting Grant Park and Jackson Park. The drive connected the two major parks in 1929. This part of Lakeshore Drive was more highway-like than the northern section. In the north, it was a Lincoln Park pleasure drive. In the south, it was always intended to connect parks and public buildings and carry traffic. So now Chicago had two Lakeshore Drives, but no way of connecting them across the Chicago River. The primary barrier wasn't the river itself, which could be easily bridged. Indeed, the Chicago River had many, many bridges. It was the Illinois Central Railroad. Remember them? They had an enormous rail yard and wharf complex right on the mouth of the river. The city and railroad came to an agreement to create an S-curve around the railroad land over a new bridge linking the two sections. This is why this area of the lakefront is also mostly private, similar to Streeterville. It was once a rail yard. The transformation from rail yard to skyscrapers was planned as early as the 1930s, as Illinois Central realized there was a great value in burying their tracks and selling the air rights for the construction of buildings. But the Great Depression and World War II stymied any plans. After the war, the railroad made it happen, and today some of Chicago's tallest buildings are at the mouth of the river. Soon after, the railroad ceased freight operations there, and all passenger traffic was consolidated at Union Station to the west. Now the Illinois Central tracks are for commuter rail only. We need to look at another part of the lakeshore, a huge piece we haven't really talked about yet. Right after Lakeshore Drive began construction between Grant and Jackson Parks, the city began another massive landfilling project to add a park in accordance with the plan of Chicago. This new park would eventually be named after Burnham himself. The park includes Soldier Field, the Planetarium, Aquarium, and Miggs Field. Miggs Field was intended to be an island, but a peninsula proved more practical. It opened in 1948 and offered passenger service through the 1970s, and by 1994 it was closed. Today it's Northerly Island Park, complete with a bandstand and beach. The dedication of Burnham Park created a more or less continuous public lakefront from Jackson Park to Lincoln Park but Chicago wasn't done yet. 
the next big addition to the landscape didn't come until the late 1990s. In 1997, the city acquired the air rights over the Illinois Central Railroad tracks at the corner of Randolph and Michigan Avenue. The city saw this extremely prime piece of real estate as an opportunity to expand Grand Park and cover the unsightly rail yards. The plan was to build an underground parking structure and use the revenues to pay for a park to cover the tracks and build a modest band shell for concerts and events. One of the reasons for the initially modest plan was that public dedication doctrine that Montgomery Ward had used to keep all buildings out of Grand Park. It was still a thing 100 years later. But the plan for Millennium Park began to get more ambitious and planners put that doctrine to the test. Much of the park was funded through private donors who wanted to see something more than grass and trees for their donations. For example, the Prickster family agreed to fund the band shell, but insisted on it being designed by Frank Gehry. And the band shell he designed was basically a building. And right behind it is the Harris Theater, which is mostly sunk below ground, but lobbies and entrances rise almost three stories above street level. And while Cloudgate, the Bean, and Crown Fountain are technically public art, they're definitely at a building scale. Add in other smaller structures like a bike station and you have a park program that have many more structures in it than the rest of Grant Park. Now, this could be fine so long as adjacent landowners didn't mind. It's the landowners that have the right to sue to enforce the doctrine. Lawyers from Millennium Park recommended that the city be proactive and get the approval of adjacent landowners for the park instead of being surprised by an objection later. They did so and there were no serious objections. Millennium Park, officially dedicated in 2004, yes, four years after the start of the millennium for which it was named, was the last major addition to Chicago's lakefront parks. That doesn't mean the lakefront won't change again, as debates over its use continue. One major conflict point is over North Lakeshore Drive, from the northern edge of the Lincoln Parkish area down to Navy Pier. This section of Lakeshore Drive is quite old, we just went over its history, and is due for a reconstruction. Lakeshore Drive was intended to be a pleasure boulevard in a park along the lake, but today acts more like a car-choked thoroughfare dividing the city from its lakefront. It's not technically a freeway, but essentially acts as one, particularly as a barrier. In 2020, the Illinois Department of Transportation released four alternatives for Lakeshore Drive, including this one they call the Essential, which is just four car lanes in each direction. The most sustainable model is called the Exchange, which is three car lanes in each direction and one transit lane in each direction. It's worth noting here that the Lakeshore has a separate bike path, which is why the IDOT isn't including one in these plans. It is telling that the IDOT can't imagine an option that doesn't include at least six total lanes of car traffic and doesn't even give the public an option that's less car-centric. In response to these disappointing options, the organization Better Streets Chicago has proposed its own alternative. It's two car lanes in each direction, two dedicated transit lanes, bike lanes, sidewalks, and parking. This proposal changes Lakeshore Drive into a surface street connected to the street grid instead of a separate parkway that acts like a freeway. I like that it brings Lakeshore Drive closer to its origins as a pleasure drive. The efforts of Better Streets Chicago are exactly what should be happening all over the United States. We need to recognize when local and state planning efforts fail to provide a robust set of options and propose new alternatives if necessary. At this point, even maintaining existing freeways is a form of climate denial. And in a climate emergency, we don't have time for it. And the efforts of Better Street Chicago also fits in nicely with all of the efforts to create what has to be, Lakeshore Drive or not, one of the absolute best urban waterfronts in the world today. The work of a city is never done. It's always growing and changing. In Chicago's case, it quite literally grew from a shoreline right along Michigan Avenue to miles of amazing parks, beaches, museums, and structures that are definitely not buildings. Other waterfront, the Chicago River. If you'd like to hear a brief and fascinating history of that river, including the story behind reversing the flow from the lake to the Mississippi, you can check it out on Nebula. That content actually replaces this ad because there aren't ads on Nebula. We're calling this bonus content Nebula Plus, and you'll see a lot of it over there. And not just for me. Loads of other creators are doing the same thing. Nebula is great, and it's made even better thanks to our partnership with CuriosityStream. CuriosityStream is the source for high-quality, engaging documentaries. If you'd like to learn more about Chicago history, they have a great episode of the show Butterfly Effect that tells the tale of Al Capone, Chicago, and the Prohibition era. It's a great human-scale complement to the grand history you just watched. We have a deal where if you sign up for CuriosityStream using the link below, you'll get Nebula for free. That's not a free trial, but free as long as you're a CuriosityStream member. And they're running a special deal where you can get the entire year for 26% off. That's less than $15 a year for both CuriosityStream and Nebula. 
Signing up is a great way of supporting this channel as well as the dozens of other creators working to make Nebula a success. Best of all, it's just a really good deal too. So go sign up using the link in the description and get 26% off.